Welcome to Purdue University College of Science Superheroes of Science podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to the science classroom and interviewing scientists. Because as we know, the scientists are the superheroes behind the science. So join us as we learn about the scientists and explore current trends in K-12 science education. Welcome to a special edition of Superheroes of Science. We're here at the Lawrence Hall of Science in Cal- in Berkeley, California, with Peter Falcon, communication specialist for the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That's it. Welcome, Peter. All right, so I guess the first thing is, it's a long title. What do you do? That's a good question. I support a couple of missions in space. Uh, SMAP, which measures soil and moisture, and CloudSat, which measures clouds. Uh, but we also do a lot of thematic um, communication, so and a little bit about a lot of Earth science instruments. And some about the airborne campaign that we have. I'm also a globe trainer, a uh, master trainer, and um, just work with students and teachers whenever I can. How did you get into, uh, I guess, like your career path? I mean, you're working at NASA, mm-hmm. which is like amazing. And uh, it's, uh, before we're done, I want you to, to tell uh, Sarah about the when you were, I think it was Taiwan. And uh, Taiwan. how the, sorry, Taiwan, sorry. Um, <laughs> And how the is like the parents, teachers, or the all the students, teachers, and everybody wanted to be you know, like pin on the globe thing and yeah, or not globe, the NASA, sorry, the NASA badges and yeah, yeah, that's just, I, think, I don't forget, I forget if it was Malaysia or Thailand, but <clears throat> like Emily said yesterday, they really do treat you like rock stars. It's really interesting because you're talking to well, first off, when they hear you're from NASA, they they think of a white, you know, old man with bushy beard. Uh, yes. balding and everything. I got the balding part down, but the, the old part, not too much. Um, so when I go and talk to them, I relate to them in a different way because uh-huh. uh, I play video games, I watch movies, and I can connect I can connect with them in that way. So it really throws them for a loop thinking, are you sure you're from this? And I'm thinking, <laughs> do I not look smart enough? Yeah, <laughs> I am from here. Are you questioning me? <laughs> yes, um, from so it kind of breaks that, that barrier down yes. a little bit and they feel more comfortable able to you know just talk about stuff. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, it's kind of interesting because you can be talking to somebody like this, and I would remember uh, another student getting her phone as she's texting, and then she just kind of does this and takes a, a picture of me talking to somebody else, <laughs> and I can see the flash. So I turned and I go, "Would you like a photo?" And you know, of course, she's doing this. Like I didn't. Yeah, I didn't think that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, it's really interesting to see that you know these students. For you, like you said, they're like a, a superhero um, in the flesh, and they want to they want an autograph, they want a picture. They even want you to sign their T-shirts, their hats, anything you can, even even they have the shirt they're wearing. I, I mm-hmm. remember thinking, I'm going to ruin the value of this shirt if I sign it. Why, why would you like me to do that? Um, and then with NASA stickers or pins, you know, often I would just give it to them if I had had them on hand. But they would request that they, you know, I pin them on them like a military uh, oh. ordeal. Yeah. <laughs> so they would line up uh, tall and straight, and I would, you know, kind of very graciously thank them oh. and pin on them, and they would be very happy. And of course, I want to take photos, and then I'd move down the, the lines. Oh, like how that. neat! It's very interesting. You yeah. know, it's, it feels very humbling to be able to do that and, and realize, uh, you know, these these places. This is a very special thing for them. So I try to, to do my best to make sure I'm a good ambassador of not only the U.S. but of NASA as well. I think so that's I would really definitely say you're a good ambassador. Absolutely. <laughs> and what how cool to be able to be in and be a part of those cultures. Oh yeah, I know. I went to a globe annual meeting with you. Yeah, we have to. We happen to find each other at the airport, and uh, we. I'm gonna say you gave me a ride up to the big hotel we're staying, and we went out to eat mm-hmm. with them. Yeah, and uh, it, that for me, it, that was so neat. Just being eating lunch with all of these kids and teachers, and it, it was really their culture. Being able to share their culture, even for a few minutes, was a really awesome experience. Mm-hmm. I. Can't imagine how cool it was to go there and do that. Yeah, it is very neat, and it's interesting to see that these these students, you know, no matter what country they're from, they're kids just like U.S. students, yeah. and they they like to take selfies just like everyone else. They like to, to chit chat and and goof off, and it's funny to, to see that you know that relationship where you think like this is a Muslim student. I'm not used to dealing with them, but then you realize they're kids too, right. and, and they enjoy the same things as U.S. students. And it's, like I said, it's very special to be able to go there and just sit down, have lunch with them. I actually, every time I do something like that, 
I try to avoid the adults and just go sit with the students so I can just talk, talk with them. I would see a group of students sitting down. I would purposely go and sit down with them and just ex- introduce myself and just, you know, chit chat yeah. and try to make conversation. See, that's yeah. awesome. I think there's a lot of people that would feel uncomfortable doing that. Right. So I think it's really neat that you intentionally. I, I think it, it's part of my upbringing. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but I grew up in a huge family. I have like eight or nine aunts. I think eight aunts, one uncle. On my mom's side alone and my dad's side, there's 10. And each one of those aunts or uncles has about between two and four kids. And those kids have kids. So I have roughly anywhere between like 60 to 80 cousins wow. that I just, you know, grew up with. I was one of the older ones. So for me, I always have to take care of the little ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's no big deal to, you know, do stuff and then make sure that one's okay and look over there and that's okay. Yeah. Um, so now when I work with kids, it's it's kind of second nature. Sure. Right? Mm-hmm. I feel like, like because of that upbringing and having all those kids in my life <clears throat> and being one of the older cousins, um, it's kind of easy to, to be able to make those connections. Yeah. Now, where did you grow up? In Los Angeles. In, in Los Angeles? Mm-hmm. Oh, so my so family is from Mexico, yeah. uh, but I grew up in LA. Actually, a very interesting story. I'm not sure if you want to say that, but my grandmother actually grew up in a small town in, in um, Guadalajara. It's called Guanacatlan. Uh, she had, this is very strong. When you talk, talk about superheroes and, and strong people in your life, to me, my grandmother is one of the most, <coughs> actually getting cracky with voice. Uh, she's one of the most strongest people I know. She actually had, like I said, nine kids. I think one of them passed away at birth in a small town. Uh, Husband would leave to Chicago to work and send money. Um, very uh, abusive husband, very macho husband. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'd literally come back just to get her pregnant and then go back. And all this time he had like a, a girlfriend over there as well. But um, my, at one point, my grandmother had had basically enough. So she, with our kids in the middle of the night, she actually did her homework, got the paperwork in order with the help of her brother, got them all passports. And in the middle of the night, packed up all her kids, left, got in the van with her brother, went to Los Angeles, not knowing the language, the culture, having a job, and basically just provided for all her kids to, to avoid this abusive husband. So she did this, and she kept them all in mind. None of them, you know, they're all good people. They have families of their own. None of them got involved with drugs or alcohol, anything like that. Grew up in inner cities in Los Angeles. And it's a credit to her that she, she ruled with an iron fist, from what I'm told. Um, yeah. like in my culture, it's, we have a joke about the sando, chancla. If you act up, a mother can fling it from across the room like a boomerang and hit you and come back <laughs> keep you in order. I need one of those. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, she, from what I think of my grandma as this tiny little frail, you know, person who can cook extremely well. But I hear stories from my aunt saying, oh no, she, she would get a whip and she'd get whatever belt. And apparently when my dad was courting her, courting my mom, my grandmother didn't like it too much so she would dump buckets of water on him to get him to leave her alone uh, and uh, my aunt said you know your dad must really love your mom because he would come back and come back and come back uh, so she's trying to scare him off uh, to leave her daughters alone to leave this daughter alone and uh, he never never left but the fact that she was able to do that and um, and raise a family like that uh, is, is credit to her you know her strength so I think she worked like three or four jobs and her youngest daughter is 13 years old. So my aunt is only 13 years from my grandmother. And then oh, after that, it's most pretty much every every year. Oh That's kind of interesting. Like, I'm like, wow, who really just picks up the leaves and uh, goes to a whole other country, not knowing anything. It's a lot of courage. Yeah. 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 So that that's who my superhero is. Uh, I, like, I, I love like that. that. Yeah. So you grew up close to family. Definitely. Sounds very close to family. Mm-hmm. And it's been my experience a lot of times when people are really close to family it's hard to get out of that mm-hmm. and be able to get a career mm-hmm. like you have so how what happened what um opportunities were you being were you able to take advantage of to end up working at nasa now well <clears throat> a young age, young age we uh, lived near usc university of southern california and i remember <clears throat> driving with my father around uh, downtown stuff and, and seeing the university. And I remember just saying, like, what's that? And he said, oh, that's that's USC, that's college. That's where you go <clears throat> to be a doctor, lawyer, and stuff like that. I can't get, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> 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 and uh, at that point, I remember thinking, I want to go to college. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to be the first one 
from my family to go to the university. <laughs> Actually, getting getting too heavy. Yeah. Um, because nobody else had gone to college except maybe like a, you know some had a high school degree. Most of them had high school degree. Maybe some had like you know community college and dropped out after a while. But I wanted to be the first one to go to um, university and kind of do something with my life, right? Um, so that was my <laughs> so that was my uh, my uh, uh, striving force to to do that and kind of <clears throat> be a good representative for my family. So yeah, so that's what <laughs> and that that's, happened. That's so really cool. after that's, high school, did you go straight to college then? I did. I actually went to uh, community college first in Pasadena. Um, I actually left the area that I went to school in because I wanted to avoid my friends and not get caught up, uh, you know, in little mm-hmm. clicks. So I actually went to school where I knew nobody, um, so I can kind of concentrate on school. Um, and actually, when I first went, I did about two years of architecture school. So I did all my community college work, coursework, did two years of architecture classes, uh, but I also was, was interested in the major that I graduated in, which was psychology. So my background is in psychology. I did, um, like, research work in two different research um groups. I was actually published as an undergrad, and wow. I worked as a suicide hotline prevention person. Oh, so wow. I would basically talk to, talk to people in the community um, about you know, maybe depression, uh, mm-hmm. suicide, um, schizophrenia, whatever they would call for, I would answer and just make sure that they were okay for the night. I couldn't, you know, it wasn't like a long-term fix, but at least I can keep them safe for that night. Um, and then at that time, I happened to be working at JPL as a, a student worker. So I kind of had one foot in psychology world, you know, working, doing that stuff. And then I also worked at JPL at NASA um, doing really basic clerical work, but doing it in the project office. So I got to meet a lot of the project managers, the engineers, the scientists that built the instrument that I was supporting. And just because I was very curious, um, I asked lots of questions. I got to learn a lot about engineering, a lot about science. Um, a lot of times... The engineers would come to meet with the project manager, and he was often behind schedule. So uh, they would have to wait five, ten minutes in the, in the office area. Yeah. So I would use that as an opportunity. Uh, I would grab the model of the instrument and just bring it out and uh, just ask them questions. You know, what is this? What's this part? How does this work? What is it? I found out very quickly people love to talk about what they do. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you talk about their science, about their project, it's kind of like me, my instrument. Of course, I'm going to talk to you about my stuff. Uh, so they're very, they're very upcoming, up, up for it about tell me, this is the battery, that's the radar, these are the solar panels, this is a computer, this is a KU band. This is so I got to learn, learn a lot about the radar technology um, and about the principles of, of how that worked. <clears throat> and then also when the scientists would come, I would do the exact same thing. I would print out the science product and just say. What's that color mean? What does this do? Why is this important? How does it impact me? Answer all my questions. And then since they had standing meetings, I knew they were going to be back next week. I would ask more questions. And they would start posing questions to me. This does wind speed. What happens if you overlay it with ocean ter- o- ocean surface uh, temperature? I, was like, I don't know. I go, go figure it out. So I would go back, uh, just Google stuff, you know, start looking things up, looking at our websites. And I would start making the connection and the relationships between the two different variables. And then I would come back and say, oh, this is what happens. You know, they, they are the driving force of the ocean and the currents do this. And I said, yeah, yeah. Now, what about this? And I would have to go back and kind of look things up. So it was a great place to work and great place to, to learn from some of the brightest minds in the industry. Um, and then when the person who had my job retired, I just happened to graduate at the same time. And she recommended that uh, my manager, who had just just come on to JPL, new from the private sector, she basically said, you should hire Peter. He knows a lot. And um, I remember meeting with her one time. She just happened to be at lunch, and she had all the different mission pages up, and she's trying to read through and figure out what mission does what and who does where and trying to you know get the org chart in line. Yeah. And uh, as, as I'm standing over her desk, she goes, do you know any of this? I said, yeah, that's Topex. That does ocean surface topography. The manager is Gary. He's right over there. And the project scientist is Fugli. Oh, that's QuickScat. Oh, that's Jason. Oh, that's Grace. Oh, that's... And then she looked up and said, you should really apply for this position. You know a lot. And I thought, I don't really... I don't think so. It's not my thing. I did psychology. And then it dawned on me, like, wait, I just explained her, her job to her. Uh, and I'm thinking, maybe she's right. Maybe I do know a lot more than I do. 
and I kind of feel like I got Miyagi into it, and uh, you know, <laughs> kind of learned this stuff uh, by that. And it's funny, I just remember being at an open house and um, standing at the clean room. We have a little viewing gallery, and the mission I supported was inside the clean room. So my job was, as people came up, I was just going to explain to them exactly you know what I'm seeing, what it does, how it works, and. Um, the more I did it, the more times people would come up and say, are you an engineer? You know? And they go, oh, are you a scientist here? No, I'm, dude, I'm a student. And they go, oh, well, you you know so much. I just thought you were an engineer. You, ex- you explained exactly everything, how it works on that instrument, and what every component is, and every question I asked, you knew the answer to. Uh, so they just assumed that I was an engineer. And then also when I talked about science, they assumed I was a scientist. Uh, and that's when they realized, like, oh, maybe, have a, maybe I'm pretty good at this stuff. Well, I love the everything started with questions. Yeah, yeah. You asking questions, mm-hmm. then other people ask questions, and you looking for answers to questions. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, you say, "Okay, I'm not a scientist," but that's exactly what you are. In a sense, yeah. You, so, you're yeah. you're posing questions and finding answers oh, yeah. to this. Hey, that's what a scientist does. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, I mean, that's exactly what you are. I think a lot of students struggle with <laughs> asking those questions. I think a lot of students are sitting in classrooms thinking, I have questions about this, but I don't want to ask it because I don't want teachers to think that I'm dumb or I don't want teachers to think that I don't know anything, mm-hmm. which seems like the opposite of what they should be thinking. They, they need to ask the questions because they don't know. Yeah, that was me. That was exactly me. I would just listen, observe, and if I had questions, maybe I would ask somebody else to ask a question for me uh-huh. because yeah. I was uh, afraid that I was going to say something, you know, stupid, if you will, or, or something that was totally off topic. Yeah. Um, but then when other people would ask questions, I thought, that's what I was going to say. Okay, good. You're just as confused as I am or, you know, good. You, you have the same, we're in the same process mm-hmm. and it made me feel a bit better. But even to this day, it's something, uh, if it's something that I don't know a lot of, I still struggle trying to get a voice. But I've noticed that somebody points at me, so Peter will say it, then I can stand up and say it and uh, they okay, I got to represent uh, the little group that I'm in uh-huh. um, and then I will say what I have to say. And for the most part, people usually say, oh, yeah. That's, that's fine. Well, I know when I first get your backstory explains so much because it's like the first time I met you at a conference, I went home and I'm, I'm telling my wife and kids about the different people. I'm like, these people from NASA I met. And I'm like, there's this guy, Peter, and he hands down is the nicest person you will meet on planet Earth. <laughs> However, NASA got him, but they scored because he is the nicest person to represent NASA. I couldn't think of a better person. And I, I tell you what, every time I meet you, I'm more and more impressed, which is hard to, I could be, I, I don't know. It's, I'm rarely speechless, but I might be there. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> You're just the nicest person in the world. So the job going in, in I mean, being a specialist, which you are, mm-hmm. and you've, you've worked to become that. What is, I mean, you've been all over the world. I mean, you go different countries, you do things here. What's something that stands out, one of the coolest things that you've done? Hmm. Uh, I know, we're throwing tough ones at you now. Yeah. I, we I, let I, you wake up before. <laughs> like I said, I've, I've been, I feel very fortunate, very humble to be able to go, to go to so many different countries and work with so many students and teachers. But I would have to say, Probably one of the most special things is when I go to a country that doesn't have the same resources as we do in the U.S. and see, you know, how happy they are. Um, they're happy to have me. They're very, they'll give me the t-shirt off their back if they can. Um, they treat you so well, with such respect, um, and it's very humbling. And actually makes me feel more of a connected with the world because when I get back home, maybe I get back in my car and ding in it. I thought, oh, man. And I think, you know what? I was in a car that had holes on the bottom. I can actually see the, the road as it's going through. This is nothing. Um, maybe didn't pay the water bill. I'm like, oh, man. And I think, you know what? I've been to countries where you can't even drink the water or it comes out rusty from the faucet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think this is nothing. This is first world problems. And then I really get an appreciation for all the things we have in this country um, and all the things that I'm used to having, the infrastructure, the lights, power, food to eat, um, then I realize you know, how special the U.S. is. But then it also makes me more humble, makes me respect um, other countries when I see them uh, perhaps struggling. But but they may not, not have resources, but as I mentioned, they're very happy. I always mm-hmm. went everywhere I went, they're very happy to have me and always you know, they'll give me whatever they're growing in the back of the yard, anything they have, any 
it, it's, it's very special to be able to do that and like I said, represent the U.S., represent NASA, um, and be able to, to teach them, but also learn from them as well. Because mm-hmm. I love that cultural experience. I try to learn languages, uh, names, and try to keep that connection going. Mm-hmm. So my social media, I'm not huge on it, but every time I look, I have languages from you know, Thailand, Taiwan, um, Spanish, uh, just all over Africa, just all these different languages that my students post, my little friends as I call them. Um, and it's interesting to, to kind of see what a, what a connection we can make, especially mm-hmm. with social media now. Yes. So it's not a social media post, but advice for those kids. If there's, because the <clears throat> podcast, teachers, kids, the main audience, scientists listen to them just to hear what everybody else is doing, I think. Mm-hmm. But what advice do you have to those kids? If you get to give them one piece of advice, what's it going to be? Ask questions. Ask, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, don't be afraid to kind of break from what you're used to doing. Mm-hmm. Get out of that, that level of comfort. Um, and use the opportunities that you have. Somebody like me goes, you know, goes to your country and says, here's my email. Here's my uh, Facebook. You know, contact me. Use that opportunity. Contact that person. Um because a lot of times what we do is it's, it's about connections, about who you know, um, the information passes down that way. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very easy to just reply to email and say, here's an answer to your question. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say use those opportunities that you have um, and reach out as well. Awesome. Good. You, we're going to kind of leave you with the most difficult question, right? Mm-hmm. We're here at NARM, we're kind of on our last day. And let's pretend that you get to fly home and you have a whole week in front of you, you have nothing planned. What would you do to unwind for fun? Well, um, I I think I must have been like a very like borderline ADHD kid because I'm always very active. I'm in lots of sports, um, so I, I weight train a lot. I play softball. I play football. Um, play with basketball with my nephews. But uh, if I'm not doing that, I'm a homebody. I like I enjoy being home. Mm-hmm. Um, enjoy cleaning actually. I, as soon as I get home, I will clean my house. And then when I leave, I will clean it again. <laughs> so I get enjoyment from cleaning. Um, and just watching movie, playing video games, unwinding. I'm a bit of a homebody, a bit of an introvert. Although I can talk to a lot of people, I do need my downtime. Uh-huh. So my downtime is when I get to go home and just kind of relax. Okay. Very That's nice. awesome. Yeah. We appreciate We appreciate you taking time to do this. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for all your encouragement for students to ask questions and things and in working with students. I think that's just really awesome that you can be a good role model for kids. So. I try. It's very hard for me to say no. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you love superheroes of science, be sure to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Be sure to join us as we add interviews of scientists and incorporate discussions of current trends in K-12 science. Until next time, be super and remember, you are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down.